introduction part what is food for pathogen food for pathogen is a biological agent that can cause foodborne illness event the broad spectrum of foodborne infections has changed dramatically over time as well established pathogens have been controlled or eliminated the new one will emerge as the figure shown below as you can see at the below one which is the vegetable one there's also we can also inoculate very much bacteria and the other figures also stated that there is many other bacteria in the raw fruit for this slide i will tell you about the foodborne illness and mode of illness that cause from the foodborne the foodborne illness can come from many sites like organisms such as viruses, pathogenic bacteria, yeast and molds, chemicals and natural toxins. While for the mode of illness, it can cause intoxication or poisoning, infection and toxic infection. The figures below shows about a girl that have a stomach ache that is caused by the pathogenic bacteria that react inside her stomach. And then a woman who is vomiting, it also maybe can be caused by the foodborne illness or pathogen inside the stomach or two. And also the last figure show about a girl, a little girl that has a fever that is caused by mostly from yeast or fungi toxin that react with her body metabolism. Hi. My name is Aida Zahira and my matrix number is 200426. I am going to proceed with the next part of the presentation, which is the changes over time. In this part, I am going to discuss in detail about the broad spectrum of foodborne infections that has changed dramatically over time. Okay, from this slide, you can see the list of foodborne agents that have emerged in the past three decades, include bacteria, virus, parasites, biotoxin, and also prion. So the changes over time, of course it is increasing. The list of foodborne pathogen is still expanding until nowadays. But how the new and also emerging foodborne pathogen is increasing? So, foodborne pathogen often emerge from animal reservoir. 70% are sustained in animal populations and affect humans only incidentally. Some common bacterial foodborne pathogens are adapted to particular reservoir, making the targeted control strategies feasible. Then, the reservoir where this pathogen persists allow pathogens to undergo a pathway by which they reach humans to occur. As I mentioned before, the foodborne pathogen is increasing over time. So do the vehicles of infections. The list of implicated foods is regularly expanded as new ones are identified in new outbreaks. For instance, between 2006 and early 2012, 15 new specific food types were identified as food vehicles in outbreak affecting the United States. So, as the food vehicles increase, so do the emergence of foodborne pathogens. In the end, this phenomenon results in new and also emerging foodborne pathogen. However, what caused this phenomenon to occur? I think let's have the next presenter to answer this question. Hi, my name is Nasuha and my partner is Anissa and Aisha. So today we will pre will be presenting the factors that contribute to new and emerging foodborne pathogens. I'll be presenting the changes in pathogen and development technology. Changes in pathogen, it is basically through the microbial adaptations through natural selection in which it is a key process in the emergence of pathogens. As we all know, uh, microbes have an advantage in adaptations such as in unfavorable unfavorable conditions, which is uh, resistant to heat and acidity that can help them to uh, emerge and uh, distribute widely. Uh, for instance, Salmonella enterotidis fish type 4, which uh, have uh, developed an outbreak in Southern California, have developed a trait that enable it to rapidly uh, replace closely related to Salmonella enterotidis fish, types in egg laying uh, poultry environments. So next is development technology. So new pathogen can emerge because of the changing ecology or changing technology 
that connects a potential pathogen with the food chain as the food products uh, have been developed with uh, contaminants pathogens it will distribute uh, across 20 uh, countries that can may lead to the uh, food uh, poisoning or stomach edge hence um, as we are practicing the development technology we must also implement it, the knowledge of modern technologies good manufacturing practices hygiene and not to forget to implement the HACCP, which is Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point and uh, Quality Control, as it is important to produce a good uh, product. I to Aisha. And so I will be um, talking about uh, new food trends. And there are two points that I want to, uh, to share. The first one is a large consumption of fresh produce in healthy diets and fresh herbs that are consumed raw or added to food after cooking. These are the new food trends that are causing uh, food pathogen to re-emerging. Um, the first one is uh, because uh, the increased use of fresh produce in ready-to-eat meals, for example, uh, healthy salads in diets has uh, causes an outbreaks uh, in 2001 from uh, strawberries and Roman lettuce. Uh, there were a salmonella outbreak uh, and in 2008 um, peppers has causing a uh, um, e. coli outbreaks and in 2006 there are salmonella outbreaks in US from uh, spinach that comes from ready to eat meals. The next is fresh herbs. The fresh herbs are gaining popularity in culinary practice especially in western or uh, Europe countries. Um, previously herbs can be bought as whole plants but nowadays they are sold in pre cut herbs. So um, the function of fresh herbs are used as a decoration or as seasoning to add uh, flavor, color, and aroma. Um, uh, so uh, there are several screening of imported herbs resulted in detection of an enteric pathogen, which uh, mainly come from Southeast Asia. So uh, the sources of uh, uh, imported herbs come mainly come from India and Thailand. Um, the uh, herbs that are uh, contaminated with uh, salmonella is coriander, curry leaf, and bacillus. So what are the causes of uh, the uh, infection of uh, salmonella in these herbs? Uh, mainly because um, pre-cut herbs are grown in a soil and open fields with drip or overhead irrigation as you can see which causes um, it may be susceptible to microbial contamination and increase uh, the risk of outbreak of salmonella. Uh, next I will pass to Anissa. Okay, um, thank you Aisha. So moving on to the next factor that contributes in the spread of new and emerging food pathogens are poverty, pollution, and dietary habits. So how do they employ this effect? Okay, firstly, poverty and pollution can lead to the emergence of foodborne pathogens and consequently cause foodborne illnesses. This is due to the poor social conditions such as food insecurity that makes people consume whatever food there are, such as on the street and others. Next, the environmental contamination increments, such as bacteria, chemicals, or natural cause reason during and after processing of preparation of, of food. And lastly is the lack of safe food preparation facilities, such as poor storage place and unhygienic kitchen, like dirty knives and improper place of cooking. So all of this results in a favorable environment for the foodborne pathogens to reproduce and spread through consumption of the food. Meanwhile, dietary habits, it also affects in the spread of new and emerging food pathogens without us realizing it. This is because of the unhealthy dietary preferences and practices, including cultural influences that consume raw or hazardous food. For example, the consumption of bat that is known to carry Ebola virus and Marburg virus by some Asian and African countries. Um, other than that, in Japanese culture, they consume raw food such as raw egg, meat, and fish, 
Now you all know sushi and these of course can potentially lead to salmonella or other foodborne pathogen infections. However, for an additional info for all of you, the process of producing, washing and selecting meat, fish and eggs in Japan is very strict in order to prevent these infections. So now let's move on with the organism of new and emerging foodborne pathogens. My name is Farzana and right now I am going to explain the first example of new and emerging pathogens, which is Listeria monocytogenes. The classification of Listeria monocytogenes are they are from the phylum Firmicutes, class bacilli, order bacillales, family Listeriaceae, and the genus Listeria. The characteristics of Listeria monocytogenes are they are rod shaped and gram positive, which means they retain the violet stain after the colorization step of gram staining. They does not produce spore. They are facultatively anaerobic, which means they, ca they are cap capable of surviving in the presence of oxygen and also oxygen deprived condition. They are psychotrophic organism which means they are able to grow under a wide range of temperature, which is from 1 degree Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. They are catalase positive and also oxidase negative, and they express uh, beta hemolysin, which means they can uh, break down red blood cells and also hemoglobin completely. Next, Listeria monocytogenes. They are actively motile by means of petritious flagella, at room temperature, which is between 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. And under room temperature, they exhibit a characteristic of tumbling motility outside host cells when viewed under light microscopy. So this is the example of the tumbling motility of Hysteria monocytogenes. Next, they does not synthesize flagella at body temperature. So in host cells or in animal cells, they can move within eukaryotic cells by explosive polymerization of actin filaments known as comet tails or actin rockets. Listeria monocytogenes are um, mostly grow in moist environment, in soil, water, decaying vegetation, and also animals. They are infamous for surviving and growing well in refrigeration temperature ranges. They can also survive in oxygen poor condition because they are facultatively anaerobic, which means they can survive in processed food, in canned food, and also vacuum packed foods. Assalamu alaikum and hi. My name is Anishna Jorgen Asli and my metric number is 201096. Now I will explain more about Listeria monocytogen history, the disease name, and what it costs. So the disease name for Listeria monocytogenesis is Listeriosis. So what is Listeriosis? Listeriosis is a bacterial infection most commonly caused by Listeria monocytogenesis. But El Ivanovi and El Gragi also have been reported in certain cases. Next, Listeriosis is usually mild illness for pregnant women, but it causes several diseases in the fetus or newborn baby. Some people with Listeria infection, most commonly adults, 65 years old and older, and people with weakened immune system, develop several infection of the bloodstream, causing sepsis. Some people with Listeria infection, most commonly adults, 65 years old, and people with weakened immune system develop several infection of bloodstream called sepsis or brain causing meningitis or encopalitis. Listeria infection can sometimes affect other parts of the body including bones, joints and sites in the chest and abdomen. Then an estimated 1,600 people get listeriosis each year and about 260 died. Next, from the slide, you can see the outbreak of listeriosis from 2011 until 2021. In 2011, a cantaloupe outbreak due to listeria resulted in 147 people sick 
in 28 states and 33 deaths. That's all for me. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good morning. I bid to Prof Shu and all my friends. My name is Nur Shafika binti Farawani with metric number 201305. So I will proceed with the next organism which is known as a Cyclospora chiantenesis. Cyclospora chiantenesis is actually a coccidian parasite that have been recognized as an emergent pathogen that cause a protracted diarrhea in human. So, the first cases that have been reported for Cyclospora have occurred during late of 1970s and the region that have been observed have been classified as an endemic region. Since then, Cyclospora have been classified or known as a travelers diarrhea and Cyclospora also originally known as a novel pathogen of probable coccidian nature in 1980s and fully characterized in 1990s but during 1995 there's an outbreak that caused by the cyclospora occur in the united states and also in canada due to the import of the raspberry so that was a short brief about uh, cyclospora cayentinesis so we move on to the characteristic so as usual each organism have their own general classification from phylum to genus, same as a cyclospora. So the phylum is epicomplexa, the class is coccidia, and the order is eucordiorida, e, sorry, eucidiorida, family is imerida, and the genus is cyclospora. So that was a general classification of cyclospora. Next, we move on to the uh, characteristic or morphology so it's cyclospora is actually a coccidia like bodies or cyanobacterium like bodies and it's also unicellular size in 8 to 10 nanometer in diameter wall of oocyte is actually thin and colorless with a bilayer structure presence and for the infection it's also produce an infection which known as a cycloporosis that have occurred in a non-immune person which is ultimate self-limited from 7 to 9 weeks and for the life cycle each sporulated osis carries two sporocytes that contain two sporozoids each and the sporozoid released during the existation are elongated in the shape and may measure about one times 9 nanometer and lack of refractile bodies. As for the adaption, cyclospora adapt, can adapt in environment by highly resistant of the disinfectant that have been used in water and food processing. So it means that it's resistant from any disinfectant. And it's also able to, to strongly bind to the fine hair like projector or projection on the topography of the fruit which allow the parasite retention on the fruit and lastly it's capable of binding to given the fresh produce which the stickiness is weaker compared to the cyclospora osis so that's all for the characteristic move on to the next presenter thank you my name is Mumtaz Binti Ibrahim and my metric number is 201047 and I will explain about the mechanism of pathogenesis and where this species can be found. In the mechanism of the pathogenesis of the cyclospora species, following ingestion, sporulated oocysts exist in the gut where they release sporozoids that invade epithelial cells of jejunum and duodenum precisely. After that, a sexual multiplication will result in the invasion of the small intestines. As a result, the parasite will interfere with the normal absorption process of our body. Moving on, the cyclospora species is found in tropical and subtropical regions. And the foodborne outbreak has commonly been linked to various types of fresh produce that we commonly found in fresh market, such as raspberries, lettuce, basil, and cilantro, as we can see in the pictures below. 
Apart from that, cyclospora is spread by consuming contaminated food and contaminated drink. And also, recently there is no frozen food or commercialized canned food that is actually linked with the cyclospora infections. And as for your information, this infection is unlikely to be spread from one person to another. That's all from me. Let's move on to the next point. Hi everyone, my name is Muhammad Zakir Iman Musically and my metric number is 200990. So, now I will present for the last part of this organism. So, what is the disease caused by Cyclospora carrion tenesis? It called Cyclosporiasis, which an intestinal illness. So, when you remember Cyclosporiasis, rem please remember Cyclospora carrion tenesis. Next, how it transmit to humans and what are the symptoms of this disease? Cyclosporiasis generally transmitted when fecus contaminate the foods or water that been consumed by us. And so what are the symptoms? Firstly, as we can see, the symptoms are water diarrhea, stomach cramps, loss of appetite, weight loss, slightly fever, nausea, and also fatigue. And if you have this symptom, go to the hospital immediately to get treated as if you let it be, it can infect it for a month or more, which make you dehydrated and cause death later. So, this symptom usually shown after on average of 7 days or, or on range 2 to 2 weeks after ingested of sporulated oocytes. And for your information, we can diagnose this disease or organism by examining stool specimens. So next, which is now the important part is how to prevent psychosporiasis. It's easy guys, very easy. First, always wash your hand with soap and water after handling and preparing produce and raw meats and also seafoods. Secondly, wash all utensils and preparation surface after each type of food is prepared. And lastly, wash fruits and vegetables under running water before eating, cutting or cooking it, okay? So, for the last part of my presentation, I want to share off one of the case report that happened in the world, which is happened in the United States on 23rd of September 2020, where it's infected the salad bag and caused the outbreak to 14 states in the U.S., there are total 701 people have been hospitalized and some shown the symptom after two weeks. So it's quite scary. So the epidemiologic evidence and product respect indicates that the bag salad mix containing iceberg lettuce, carrots and red cabbage produced by the fresh express was likely a source of this outbreak. So um, the US government really shows a good leadership by acting fast and stop the outbreak from getting spread by find the, uh, the source of the outbreak. So it is really a good job for US government. And if you wonder why won't we take a vaccine for cyclosporosis so there will no outbreak occur, well my answer is easy. There is no vaccine available yet to prevent cyclosporosis infection. So my advice is keep your hygiene and prevent this disease because if we not the cyclosporiasis perhaps will become a pandemic just like COVID-19. So better safe than ever, guys. Right. So that's all for my presentation. So from my part. So remember, prevention is better than cure. Okay. So thank you. I'll pass to the next presenter. Assalamu alaikum and hi. Uh, my name is Nur Amanina Afika bin Pino Isbihan. My matrix number is 200991. Today, I'm going to present our last organism that we have chosen, which is Vibrio parahemolyticus. The characteristic of this organism is it is gram-negative, it is halophilic, non-performing, curve crack shape, and it has 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 micrometer in width and 1.4 to 2.4 micrometer in length. Next, it is an oxidative positive. It is an oxidase positive facultative anaerob that can ferment glucose without gas production. It has polar and lateral flagellum. The polar flagellum is functioned to enable its high motility in liquid media 
Meanwhile, collateral flagellum is functioned to allow it to migrate across semi-solid surface by swarming. It thrives in warmer water and area of less salinity. Uh, even though it goes best in warmer water, uh, but there are also outbreaks that have been reported uh, in cold, that occur in cold areas such as Alaska. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Nabila Binti Muhammad Anwar and my metric number is 200829. So today I'm going to present about, I'm going to explain about um, where Vibrovara hemolyticus can be found, the disease caused by this bacteria and also what it can cause. Okay, first, where they are found. This bacteria can be found in marine environments and often been associated with seafood. The bacteria are naturally found in salt and brackish water. Um, people become, become infected by this bacteria when they are consuming raw or undercooked um, seafood or exposing a worm to uh, seawater. The bacteria are naturally found. Um, the bacteria can thrive in warm waters and thus cause more infectious during the summer month. Next, Vibro parahemolyticus can cause disease ca called as fibrosis. Fibrosis is a potentially serious illness caused by a group of bacteria called Vibro. Most Vibro, uh, which is non cholera cases, are caused by Vibro vulnificus or Vibro parahemolyticus. Anyone can become infected with Vibro, but it is more common uh, among individuals with weakened immune system. Vibrosis is typically characterized by watery diarrhea, stomach pain, nausea and fever, and it can cause wound or soft tissue infection, um, especially in people with underlying medical condition, uh, such as liver disease. Um, this bacteria can cause septicemia, which is blood poisoning by bacteria. And septicemia occurs when a bacterial infection elsewhere in body, such as the lung or skin, enter the bloodstream. So I will, that's all from me. I will pass to Amanina to explain more about um, case history. Thank you. Vibrio parahemolyticus was first found in 1951 by Sunil Saburi Pijino. He is a researcher in Research Institute of Microbial Diseases, RIMD, Osaka University. Uh, he found this bacteria from an acute gastroenteritis outbreak that occurred in Osaka, Japan. Uh, the outbreak was due to the consumption of shirasu. Uh, shirasu is a type of dried sardine which and from this outbreak it caused uh, 20 deaths and 272 infected patients. That's all from me. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad Aziz, and for my part, I will briefly explain to you about the organization or agencies that are responsible in investigating the foodborne disease outbreaks. Before I start, bear in mind that this particular agency's involvement is taking place within a country, so it is not take place in a worldwide situation. So, according to the Center for Disease control and prevention or CDC, there are three main bodies in combating and investigating these root causes of these foodborne diseases. So the first one is the local agencies. So whenever there are short outbreak occur within a short vicinity, the local agency will take actions regarding to this issue. And most commonly it involves with one district of public health officials. And the second one is the state agencies. So whenever there are outbreaks occur and it, across, in, it spread across several cities and counties within a country, the state agency will take actions. And the state agency will often work with agriculture and federal food safety agencies 
This is because all of our food, food comprised of fruits, vegetables, meat, and poultry are coming up from this sector. So it is important in rechecking re again regarding to the working procedure. So the last one is the federal agencies. So whenever the outbreaks is involved with a large group number of people, the state agency will often teaming up with the federal agency, for example, like CDC, in order to go further investigations regarding to this, regarding to the root causes of this, of these foodborne diseases. So that's all from me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Musfira and my match is number is 20028. Now I will present about the strategies to prevent foodborne pathogens. First, we must store and handle raw and cooked food separately. We need to separate raw meat, poultry and seafood from other foods. Other than that, we need to use separate equipment and utensils such as knives and cutting boards for handling raw foods. These ways can prevent cross-contamination. Second, we need to store food at safe temperature. We need to keep cooked food hot, more than 60 degrees Celsius, until serving. And we need to refrigerate all cooked and perishable food. These methods can slow down or prevent the growth of microbes on food. Now, I will pass this presentation to Shafi. Hello everyone, my name is Nuri Shafi Anati Bin Tirezao and my magic number is 200374. Yes, this is the final part of our presentations today, which is the detection of foodborne pathogen. One of the most commonly used molecular-based methods for detection of foodborne pathogen is polymerase chain reaction, or we can call it as PCR. As you can see on the screen right now, we have PCR component, which we have DNA sample, primaries, nucleotide, PCR tube, mixed buffer, polymerase, and thermal cycler. And on your right side, we have the PCR process that is one cycle, okay? From the top to the bottom, that is a one cycle. We have denaturing, annealing, extension. All right, for denaturing, is occur at 95 degrees Celsius. At this the temperature, the DNA double helix, all right, the DNA double helix is converted into the single strand, which means the double and it goes to single. That is the denaturing. And then we go to the annealing. So annealing temperature is reduced to 55 degrees Celsius. Why? Because the primers it present, right? Uh, due to the low temperature, the bonding okay, between the primers and the template is occur. And the primer, it helps the polymers to find out of its attachment site. For the extension, it occur at 72 degrees Celsius. It is the optimum temperature for the polymers. At this the temperature, the polymers start working, okay, start working. By synthesis, start from the five prime, to the three primes, okay? As we know, it always occur at five prime to three primes, and the polymerase is help to join the nucleotide at the complementary position to the template DNA. And as a result, another copy of DNA is produced, right? So I said earlier, we need thermal cycle, right? So what happened if we do not have thermal cycle? So we run the PCR, Sure, you can run the PCR by what? What you need if you do not have the recycler? You need set up three water box. As I mentioned earlier, the denaturing and the extension, it have their own temperature because denaturing, we need 95 degrees Celsius. And the energy, we need 55 degrees Celsius. And the extension, we need 72 degrees Celsius. That's why we need three water bottles, right? Three water bottles with different temperatures to run the PCR. That is our presentation for today. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you can get a lot of knowledge about new and emerging foodborne pathogens.